this morning. As uh, we finish our series in the book of Proverbs, I want to talk about something that lies at, at the heart of who we are and who we want to be as a, a, a universal church, as a local church, and as individual followers of Jesus. And that is the idea of being difference makers. Church, it is, it is important to note that nobody wants to, nobody wants to make the team only to sit on the bench and, and never play. Nobody wants to give a gift to that special someone in their life and then hope that it's, it's never opened. Nobody wants to devote years of service to a company, and then when they retire, nobody even notices. Nobody dreams of dying and then having an unattended funeral. Nobody, and I mean nobody, wants a short obituary. We want to make a difference, not just for ourselves. Nobody hopes that at their memorial service, someone will stand up and say, you know what, they worked hard to be successful. They did a good job of acquiring power and money. They were anxious and driven and self-preoccupied. We want to leave the world a little changed. When it's time to go, we want someone to, to say about us, my life is a little richer and my world is a little bigger and my faith is a little stronger and I'm a better person because this human being walked the planet for a while. That person made a difference. That person changed my life. We don't want to be space takers. We don't want to be resume builders. We want to be difference maker. And that, that desire to make a difference is not a, not a bad thing. It's one of the most important things about us. We were made by God to want to count, to want to, to want to matter. It, it gets messed up sometimes by sin and our egos. But New Heights, we were created by the God of the universe to make a difference. So the question is this. What does that look like? Practically, how can we make the biggest difference on this planet? Well, in my opinion, and I think God's too, the biggest way for us to, to make a difference is to rescue someone from death, specifically eternal death. There are all sorts of paths, all sorts of ways for people to walk on this planet, and yet there's only one way that gives us eternal life. All other ways lead to eternal death. Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 12 says this, there is a way that appears to be right. Like, you know that, right? Like, all over this planet right now, billions of people are on a path, and, and, and many of those billions of people think, this is it, this is my way. It just feels right, it seems right, it's in my DNA, it was passed on, I'm a, I'm a Buddhist, I'm a Hindu, I'm a materialist, I'm an atheist, I'm an intellectual, that's who I am. There's a way that appears to be right, but, but in the end, it leads to death. But Jesus said this, Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13, he said this, enter through the narrow gate. Wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many enter through it, but, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to to life and and only a few find it. And that's that's scary. I guess the right question now is who's the gate? Jesus goes on. John's gospel, John chapter 10 and verse 7, Jesus says very truly, I tell you, I am the gate. I'm the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are, are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out, and they will find pasture. But the thief, well, he comes only to steal and kill and destroy. That's the thief's way. It's the way that leads to death. Jesus says this, 
I have come that you might have life and that you might have it to the full. So, how do we make the biggest difference on this planet? We make the biggest difference by bringing men, women, and children to Jesus for eternal life. Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 30, this is in the ESV. I love this translation. The writer says, the fruit of the, of the righteous is a tree of life. And whoever captures souls is wise. Write this down. As followers of Jesus, we are soul capturers. That's what we do. We position our, our lives. As Jim often says, our, our time, our talents, our monies. We position our lives in such a way as to constantly model and tell others about Jesus. Let me illustrate um, with, let me illustrate this with something that, that almost all of us use. I want you to take a look at this because this is real familiar. That brings great joy to a lot of us in this room, right? For those of you visiting, uh, maybe for the first time, you might be wondering, is this some kind of thing that they do at New Heights Church? Do they talk about a different condiment every week? No, not every week, just this week. I put this picture of salt up on the screen to help us to remember that Jesus said one day to a group of his disciples in Matthew chapter 5, and verse 13, he said this. He said, hey, guys, now you got to get this down. For these guys, salt was a really big deal. What, it isn't what it means to you and I, and I'll flesh it out in just a second. But here's this ragtag group of men, and they're standing for Jesus. And he says in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13, you guys right here, you're the salt of the earth. You're it. And to understand what Jesus meant by this, we have to understand that salt played a, a much more central role in Jesus' world than it does in ours. Does anyone know, and you can, you, can, you can answer this out loud, does anyone know what the number one use of salt in the United States today is? You can, anyone? Bacon, I like that. It, always go with bacon. Popcorn salt at the movie theater, I like that too. Anyone else? What's that? Melt, yes, de-icing the roads. 51% of all salt in America is used to de-ice roads. Now, now, mind you, that wasn't true for Jesus. When he came to earth, he did not come to a place where roads were covered by, by ice and snow because he knew that it was not God's will that people should live in such places. <laughs> right? Only 8% of all salt produced in America is used as, as table salt. And even then, some of you in this room are a little ambivalent about it because you think it might cause health problems. You're on a low-sodium salt substitute diet. Some of you were raised in families where you avoided salt because it might give you know, flavor to, to food. And so, but, but in the ancient world, this was, this was a different story people discovered that there was something really special about salt and that it was a preservative. Here's what, it, here's what it did. It keeps decay and corruption from setting in. In the ancient world, dead bodies were much more common than they are in ours. Uh, and to say the least, uh, body corruption was horrific. People discovered that there is something about salt that arrests decay and, and corruption, and so it was almost like magic. They found that if they used salt, they could preserve food in, when, before famine would come. So it literally contributed to an outcome of, of life or death. They discovered that it was a purifying agent because it would destroy bacteria. They also discovered that it, it brings delight to people who are eating because there are special taste buds, thank you God for taste buds, on our tongue that are designed to res respond to salt. So halt, salt was highly, highly prized. As a matter of fact, most of the ancient cities in, in Italy, including Rome, were founded on salt works. Romans used to pay their soldiers with salt. Some of you may know what the, the Latin word for salt is. It's the word sal. That's, that's where it is, S-A-L. It's where we get the word salary or salary, because salt was used to pay soldiers. This is where we get this expression. I want you to see this. Do you guys remember this expression? Some of you old timers, you're worth your salt. It literally meant you're worth your salary. You've earned your keep. You've earned your money. People went to war over salt. In fact, that's why we say when one country is attacked, we say this, it's been assaulted. 
No, I made that up. I, I did. <laughs> I, thought, I thought, man, I thought I'd get you on the salary, which is true. Salary, salary, and then, the, you know, assaulted. I thought I'd get you, and I got you. I love that. I love, that's not true, though. Regardless, it was prized stuff. Literally, it was currency. They went to war over it. Empires were built around it. And Jesus, when he's speaking to this undistinguished group, this motley crew, he says that God's plan to protect the world from death and decay and corruption, to purify it, and to bring whatever flavor and zest it's going to have, he says it's going to come from you, church. We are the salt of the earth. You and me. We're it. That's what Jesus says. That's staggering information. And that's, that's hard for most of us to believe. We are the salt of the earth. But there are, are sobering implications to this. One of which is, is this. And this is really my main point for the morning. Salt doesn't exist for its own sake. Josh, who's running slides this morning, I love Josh. When we were going over slides this morning, he looked at me and he said, salt doesn't exist for sake? I said, no, no. I said, Josh, get your head in the game. Come on, let's go. Salt doesn't exist for its own sake. When was the last time you went to someone's home for a meal and you said to the host, you said, hey, this is great salt. Honey, honey, why don't we have salt like this in in our home? We got to switch brands. We must always remember that salt doesn't call attention to itself. Please write this down. I'm going to put it up on the, the screen behind me. Salt's calling is to lose itself in something more glorious than itself. Like you, you take that salt and you got that big steak and you put steak, you put salt on the steak. It's not about the salt. What's it about? It's about the steak. You go to the movie theater and you got your bucket of popcorn and you put salt. It's not about the salt. It is amplifying. It is bringing into focus the popcorn, the steak, the meal, whatever it is. Salt's calling is to lose itself in something more glorious than itself. And then and only then has it fulfilled its ultimate destiny. But if we're salt, we got to get out of the shaker. And if we do, one, one difference maker in Christ can change the world. By the way, Never underestimate the power of one difference maker because one difference maker can change the fate of generations. And we are the salt of the world. We're it. Four days ago, Ruth gave me um, kind of some sobering news. Uh, really, it was a statement of fact. It was very convicting for me personally. One of those where I had trouble sleeping that night, I thought about it and I've been thinking about it ever since has actually kind of helped frame my talk. It was just so powerful for me. Four days ago, Ruth told me that one of our family members was talking to someone who wasn't a Christian. And this person who did not know Jesus said to, our, to the family member, he, he said this, you know, you know it's not true. You know it's not true. To which the family member said, well, what, what's not true? It's a Christianity. It's Christianity is not true. And the family member said, well, what, what do you mean? Explain. He said, the, the guy said, because if it was true, if Christians really believed what the, what the Bible said about heaven and hell and that Jesus is the only way. If Christians really believe what the Bible said, then there would be people constantly telling everyone about Jesus. And nobody has ever told me about Jesus. Nobody. By the way, has anybody told you about Jesus? And the family members said, nope. You know, church, and I want you to see this. We're not just here to hold services.
We're not just here to run programs. We're not just here to meet in little classes or community groups that feel safe and comfortable. Church, salt does not exist for its own sake. It doesn't exist for itself. We are here to permeate the dying world in a way that salt permeates food. Jesus says this, you, me, we are the salt of the earth. We're it. Those words are so powerful that they are often embroidered in frame and hung on walls. But then Jesus goes on. And he says this, the rest of verse 13. But, conjunction, if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under foot. By the way, did um, you ever see anybody embroider those words and hang them up on a wall? I don't think so. This is the kind of thing that made people feel uncomfortable when Jesus said it, like some of us feel right now. Some of us are going, I thought it was all about me. Like I literally thought I could just kind of take, no pun intended, really a pun intended, a little dash of God, a little dash of Jesus, a little dash of salvation, kind of, kind of put it over my life and over my children's life and my grandchildren's life or whether I'm single, just a little bit. Just I don't want too much. It's crazy. Just a little bit. I don't want to be thinking about God all the time. I don't want to be thinking about Jesus all the time. Hold on. Bucket list. Heaven. Check. All the rest are for me. Check, 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 check. Here's what our culture will try to do to us, church. It will try to seduce us to serve it rather than God. It will try to seduce us to spend our lives being too busy, too driven, too preoccupied with whatever, career, money, status, success, children, stuff. I just want a dash of God. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. One of the most amazing things to me as I, as I read scripture is, is the early church. And the people who were, were opposed to it, this is always interesting. We've seen this throughout church history. Like it never works. You think the devil would stop doing this. He just doesn't get it. But the, the people who were opposed to it, they thought, okay, here's how we stop the early church. We persecute it. So we're going to start throwing people in prison. And you know what will happen? Here's what happened. The prison started getting salty. <laughs> The prisons started getting salty. Well, that didn't work. So then they said, you know what we'll do? We'll, um, we'll just kick everybody out of Jerusalem. And we go back to the book of Acts. The believers got kicked out of Jerusalem. And guess what happens? The whole region, which first off is Asia Minor, well, it starts to get salty. And the idea that you could stop the early church by spreading Christians around, that was just getting the salt out of the shaker. You know why? Because we are the salt of the earth. All we have to do is get out to where the world is. It starts to permeate our home, our work, our neighborhood, somebody else's neighborhood, our school, and somebody else's school. Why? Because we are the salt of the earth. It doesn't matter how old, how young we are. It doesn't matter uh, what our title is or whether or not we have a title. Why? Because we are the salt of the earth. We're it. Us, by the power of the Holy Spirit, walking not in perfection but in obedience, leads to a salty culture. Church, we need to say, we need to do this. We gotta start dabbling and we gotta start getting real. We need to say, I will lay down everything because I serve the biggest difference maker who ever lived. As a matter of human history, Jesus Christ made a difference and impact on this world that no no one ever had. He was an innocent man who said, I will pour out my life And guess what he did? And then he said to us, Lee, New Heights, you are the salt of the earth. 
you're in. What I want to do for the rest of our time this morning is I want to give us two practical examples of what that looks like. I want to talk about two um, very normal people who got out of the salt shaker and into the world. Two very normal people who said, I want to capture souls for Jesus. They're not perfect people. They're just obedient followers. Uh, the first is Pastor Vitali, our very own church planner in Novo Veronish, Russia. I want to get a, a picture up there for you to see. It's about five to six hours um, to the south of Moscow. And uh, as he comes up on stage, he and his translator and Randy, I just want to tell you that um, Ruth and I had the privilege of going to Novo Veronish and experiencing firsthand the ministry of Pastor Vitaly and his wife, Allah. Uh, and without exaggeration, we have told everyone that it felt, it felt like the early church in the book of Acts. It was truly amazing to watch and to learn and for this younger pastor to sit at his feet and see what it looks like for a man who fearlessly preaches the gospel and shepherds his flock. And so I wanted him to come up this morning and share um, what does it look like uh, to be salt? What does it look like to have been discipled and to disciple and to share a little bit about the church in Russia as it is right now? So I'm going to ask him a few questions and just kind of get out of the way and let he and Randy talk. So, um, Pastor Vitali, you became a believer as a teenager, but you were not discipled um, until you were in your early 20s. Tell us about the man who discipled you and how did he disciple you? Praise the Lord. I'm so happy to be here again. I'm, um, have so many emotions running um, through me. Um, I drew closer to the Lord. The Lord has strengthened me through the pastor's sermon that we are truly the salt of the earth. And you are the salt of the earth. Imagine if we were not here, we suddenly disappeared. The world would just go into destruction because we are the salt of the earth. But also, if we don't preach the gospel, if we don't talk about Jesus Christ, so the world is going to destruction as well. So Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. And the world would, should know that our message and through us to receive Jesus Christ. Um, there's also a scripture that says, you are the light of the earth. So imagine people walking in the darkness and have no light. When pastor was preaching, I just imagined people walking in the darkness, how difficult that is. And all of a sudden, they see light in front of them. And then they have joy and they have hope. And they direct their steps toward that light. Because the light is life. And you are the light. And when they go into this light, they will hear the words, life, uh, words about Jesus. God bless you all so that you would be salt and that you would be light and let the whole world hear so the world can be blessed and free just as you are in Christ. Thank you. Um, just a little bit about myself, my story. Um, I was 17 years old. I was a musician. I didn't know Jesus. Uh, but Jesus knocked on the door of my heart and I didn't overthink it whether to give my heart to Jesus or not I just gave him my heart and I left everything and started following the Lord 
And I'm not sorry for it. Uh, прошло несколько времени. Um, some time later, я встретил человека. I met a person. Василий Васильевич. His name was Василий Васильевич. Это действительно апостол. He was truly an apostle. Через него Господь великие дела сделал. Through him, God did great work on earth. Я всегда uh, слушал его. I always listened Я to учился him. у него. I was taught by him. Вот как Павел я вспомнил, когда он сидел у ног Гамалиила. Just like Paul says that he sat at the feet слова. of Gamaliel and received the words. Я также Василий Васильевич у ног сидел. I sat at the feet of this man Vasily and I received the words that he was teaching. И он мне передавал все то, что Бог ему открыл. And he was um, giving me everything that God was showing him. И не только я, нас было много учеников. And not just me, he had many disciples. И пришло время. And the time came Когда мы уже стали пасторами. when we became pastors and we started teaching about и Jesus and through us the Lord gave us disciples and created churches. I haven't finished the university But I learned from Vasily Vasilievich that God used him to speak to me that I need to grow spiritually that I need to bring light into this world. И я стал проповедовать Иисуса Христа. And I started preaching Jesus Christ. Моя проповедь была простая. My preaching was very simple. Я подходил и говорил. Just in the streets, I came to people and I said, if you don't repent, you will die, you will perish. And many people believed. And many people received Jesus in their hearts. I was surprised myself. <laughs> Just simple words. <laughs> But people turned to Jesus. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hey, what I want to do right now is, um, this is really important. We were talking about Pastor uh, Vitaly as a difference maker, and, and uh, he feels awkward for me to even say that. But, but as much or even more so, whatever that means, the man he keeps talking about, Vasily Vasilovich, was just a common farmer, drove a tractor, an uneducated man, and God, he's, he's now with the Lord. But God used this man in a powerful way, and I wanted to put a graphic up there, and I want you to see um, what it looks like to be a difference maker. This is one man who discipled. Now, first we thought it was nine men. We found out yesterday it's 11 men. And those 11 men over the last 29 years have planted hundreds of churches, and which Ruth and I got to be, see a bunch of them, not hundreds, but a bunch of them, which are amazing. Hundreds of churches in Russia. Two men that are on the list have planted 10 churches here in the United States, both in the state of Washington and the state of Georgia, Russian churches that they planted. So I just want you to see what it looks like to be a disciple maker, the power, just the power of one. Okay, um, Pastor Vitaly, you've planted actual physical churches in other cities, but you haven't built a physical one yet in Nova Voronish, your home city, your Jerusalem, but that's changing. In 2016, when our team was with you, we visited the construction project that is now underway. That is your new church building, the House of Prayer. They call their churches Houses of Prayer. It's a great name. Um, I, I love, Ruth and I loved how it sat in the middle of a growing community. Please tell us more about it. Uh, when is it going to be ready? When is it going to be opened? And uh, how much more money do you need to, to get this thing finished? Uh, First of all, I want to give thanks to the Lord Jesus Christ that he has opened your hearts and that you have been helping us to build this church. Two years ago, um, two year, even since then, we've built on more. So the building is already there. There is electricity. There's pictures in the back <laughs> after you can If see. If you want to, to learn more about the building and more about the ministry and you want to talk with Pastor Vitaly, you can go to the table in the back or during our ministry time. He and Randy and the translator will be up here and he'll pray for you. And let me just tell you, there's no greater joy to be, than to be prayed over by Pastor Vitaly, uh, especially in Russian. It's really cool. So. 
But tell us more about the church. И я тогда проповедовал и говорил о том, что такая большая семья, как мы, и мы можем действительно построить это здание. And I always preach and I always tell others that we're one big family and we can build a building. Когда назвал такую сумму 180 тысяч. To God's glory, and he said at that time it was unimaginable amount of money for us, 180,000 to build this church. Это не мешалось разуме. I could not even comprehend it in my mind. Но здание строится. But the building is going up. It's it's being built. И мы благодарим вас то, что у вас есть вера на это. And we thank you for your faith and your support. Без веры невозможно строить. Because it's impossible to do anything without faith. And our church thanks you that you are partners with us. Church that you are partners with us. That you believed in this vision and you helped us. Thank you very much. 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 Thank And it's hard to imagine the sum that's required to finish the building. Even as we look through time, there's inflation and there's one price two years ago. Prices are growing a lot in Russia. И мы молим Бога, чтобы Господь дал нам построить это здание. And we just pray and we put it in God's hands that He would help us build it. Я верю, что мы сможем это сделать. And I believe that we will build it. Потому что мы одна семья. Because we are one family. Мне нет разницы Россия, Америка. I don't differentiate America or Russia. Я знаю, что христиане России, Christians and believers everywhere. In Russia and in America, мы уже на небесах. We know that we already belong to our heavenly kingdom. Вы представляете, каждый из вас вечность. Each one of you is eternity. Вас Христос. Because you have Jesus. Вы сегодня здесь. You're here today. Я сегодня здесь. And I'm here today. И завтра мы на небесах. And tomorrow we'll be in heaven. Слава Богу. Praise the Lord. Мы сможем это сделать. And we can do things on earth. Это желание Христа. If it's God's will. Я верю, что Господь больше вам откроет. И мы построим это здание. Спасибо. Спасибо. What I want to do is I want to ask um, one last question. I want to direct it at Randy. And Randy's going to be speaking for Brenda, his wife. These two, um, I would say the power of two, two difference makers who made a choice 27 years ago to get involved um, in the Russian church. And uh, I, I don't want to steal his story. I'll let him share. But Randy, just share a little bit about how God led you to, to come alongside Pastor Vitaly. Thank you, Pastor Lee. Um, first off, I'm... People often say, are you a missionary? And that's a puzzling question. I'm like, yes, aren't you? You know, I, uh, my story is a both and is what I like to say. Um, I've had a full career here in the United States, and I've been involved in God's work in a foreign country, originally smuggling Bibles into uh, the old Soviet Union. Uh, long story about how that happened. The whole story is on our blog. We have at the table that information, too about how God led us through a set of miraculous events to begin smuggling Bibles into Russia. Uh, wasn't too long after we began that till I got a letter from a man in Russia that said, we've got one of your Bibles, there's a revival breaking out here, and God's called me to be a pastor, can you help us? And we kind of look around each other, there's 15 or 20 of us in a house church like, we're in Prairie Grove, Arkansas, and... Oh, yeah, by the way, my city's not on the map because it's a nuclear city, and we hide those from Westerners. So hmm. we got an invitation to go to a city that wasn't on a map, and uh, so we said yes. And it's been my experience that God is, uh, uses the willing. He will equip you when you're willing to do that, and that has been our story. It's been a story of, of uh, perseverance, I would say, that, you know, you're disqualified or Satan tries to disqualify you constantly, that... You're really not capable of doing that. You're too busy. You're too whatever. And then 
when you make a mistake, when you do stumble, when you do get distracted, when this world does become attractive or your job or in my wife's case, homeschooling six kids that later seven kids, we're pretty busy. And we would forget about this or forget about that. And, and Satan would come in and say, see, I told you, you know, you'll leave that to the professionals. You know, you're not very good at this. And he would discourage you. So I would encourage any of you that if you're willing, if God gives you ears to hear his call, mm -hmm. that he will equip you and you can persist. And together with a great partner like I have had in my wife, Brenda, uh, and through prayer, you can overcome. And it's, it's been a joy, as you can tell. He's kind of contagious. And it's been a joy. Uh, for 27 years to work together. Uh, we've never had a conversation because uh, I don't speak Russian and he doesn't speak English. So my best friend and I have never been able to have a conversation. So we talk about going to heaven and how cool it's going to be in heaven because the first person I'm going to look for is Vitaly. Wow. And then we have a debate. Will we speak English or Russian in heaven? And uh, yeah. Kind of a, a yeah, good Hebrew. rivalry. You'll be there. speaking Hebrew. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> But it's been joyous how God can just knit your heart with somebody. And uh, we've been alone days at a time without a translator. And people say, how do you communicate? And it's through the Holy Spirit. He knows what English words I know or what Russian words I know and vice versa. So it's been a blessing and it's great to share it with you all. And again, more information at the back. Um, he was a little shy. I guess I'm not quite so shy. We need about $100,000 to finish this project. And what he was talking about, inflation, um, their media, I won't, you know, is like our media, I guess. It's kind of got a message it's proclaiming. That is that it's all our fault as Americans. We put sanctions on them, and we're ruining their economy, and we're ruining, we're bringing inflation. So it's a bit tough over there now to minister because the perception of Americans is not the highest. And you can show him how much, you know, you can overcome that perception the world gives about Russians, that we love him. And then we want to encourage him as a brother in Christ. Let's give these guys a hand. Thank you. <laughs> Let me finish with just uh, one example as the worship team comes back up. Um, one example that may, might feel a little more doable. I know that bringing Pastor Vitaly up and talking about Vasily Vasilovich and these men who, Pastor Vitaly didn't say, actually spent time in a gulag, in a prison, and ministering in communist Russia, and then the post-Cold War Russia, and church plant, hundreds of church plants, and you go, oh, man, I can't, I can't do that. Um, let me just say this. Um, we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. So I don't want you to think you can't do that, but let me give you an example that's a little closer to home. Just quickly, I want to get her picture up here. This is E.J. Turner. EJ is a, a junior, she's one of ours, a junior um, journalism major from Dallas, Texas at the University of Arkansas. EJ went with Linda Molman and the GTS, our global training school. They go every year to different places to visit our workers. And they went to Cambodia and Thailand. And I asked EJ to come up here and I was going to interview her, but she couldn't be here because she's helping out with sorority stuff this morning as they're bringing on um, new girls into the sorority. And uh, Linda wanted me to say, I didn't say it first service because I didn't know, but now I know that she also, every single day, EJ has been leading a Bible study for these new gals coming at 8, 8.30 in the morning. So pray for EJ and her ministry on the University of Arkansas. But uh, I asked EJ to write out her story about going to Cambodia and Thailand, and so she did. And I want to give just the highlights of it. She said, the first thing she said was, I was very nervous about the trip. She said, the sharing my faith part of the trip was um, the most incredible and life-changing part for me, but I had to overcome fear and doubt and my comfort zone. This part of the trip was the part I was most apprehensive about. She said, I've made so many mistakes in my life I'm ashamed of. And I thought to myself, what makes me worthy of sharing the gospel? Sharing my faith taught me that the Lord does not call the perfect, though. I love this line by her but he calls the obedient. He doesn't call the perfect, he calls the obedient. She also said this, I thought was really cool. One of the most amazing moments was on, on the streets in Bangkok where I met a Buddhist man who I had an hour conversation with completely through a translator. He had so many questions about my God and he didn't understand how a Thai person could know Jesus because he didn't think Jesus could understand or speak Thai. She said in that moment, 
I fell even more in love with Jesus because I knew he was powerful enough um, to speak and show his love in every language. And so I prayed. She said, I prayed that Jesus would meet this man in his prayers and speak Thai to him. Isn't that powerful? She says, I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, hopefully I'll see him in heaven. But I have faith that the Lord is working in his heart. By the way, the picture you see behind me is EJ and her new Thai friend, Jagan. On J- July 11th, just last month, EJ and a Thai believer shared the gospel, the good news, the death, burial, and resurrection, as Pastor Vitaly talked about with Jagan. And this doesn't happen often there. It's a tough place. But right there in that moment, moment Jagan gave her life to Jesus Christ. And then they invited her to come to church and to come to all the meetings, and she came to every single one. So I'm going to ask Randy to come back up, and I'm going to ask him to pray for the church in Russia, to pray for Pastor Vitaly, to pray for Jagan, this new believer, and to pray for Thailand and Cambodia. Randy. Father, we are indeed uh, humbled. God, we're humbled that you call people to be salt and to be light. God, we're forever grateful for that. We're forever grateful for those who have been faithful that have gone before us, Lord, and have instructed and taught us of your ways, God. It's a a heavy burden that's now ours. It's a joy that's now ours to carry on that work, God. And I want to pray, Lord, for EJ as she continues her work. God, I want to pray for her anointing. God, I want to pray that she would continue to walk with you, that she would hear you just as she has heard you now, Lord, and she would be obedient. God, that she would walk with you, Lord, and that the anointing of Jesus would be upon her and the power of the Holy Spirit to move and to change lives, the supernatural, Lord, to speak to I, to a man who doesn't know you can, Lord. We thank you for that, Lord. I pray that over the Russian church, God. I pray for boldness. Lord, as they've experienced new persecution, God, I just pray that you would give them strength, God, that they would rise to the occasion, Lord. I pray for Vitaly and the brothers. God, I could name a lot of them, a lot of them I can't, Lord, that are out there. God, I pray that you would fill them, God, that you would continue to empower them, Lord, that you would continue to use them to inspire us, God, to inspire us, God, to uh, get up and to be used by you. God, this all brings us to a heart of gratitude, God, a heart of worship. Lord, as we continue in our time of praise and worship to you this morning, God, let us join in the thrill with EJ and with Vitaly and others, God, that are experiencing your power, Lord, and know that as we worship you and listen to you that we can experience that every day in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray.